Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is part 20 of the Tafsir book, Tadabur al-Quran, Pondering over the Quran by Amin Islahi. We had stopped at verse 25 of chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, and we continue to read. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Inna Allah la yastahyi an yadrib mathalam ma ba'udatan fama fawqaha Fa'amma al-lazina amanu fa'ya'lamuna annahu al-haqqu min rabbihim Wa'amma al-lazina kafaru fa'yakuluna madha arad allahu bihadha mathala يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ Verse 26 of chapter 2 Allah disdains not to propound a parable of a mosquito or of something even smaller than it. Those who believe know that it is the truth from their sustainer, while those who disbelieve say, what could Allah mean by such a parable? He lets many go astray thereby and guides many thereby. And he causes none to stray thereby except those who are depraved. Verse 26. Allah disdains not to propound a parable. Darab al-Mathal means to explain a truth through a parable. Higher spiritual realities and facts are difficult to grasp for most people unless presented in the form of a parable. This gives it a special place as a literary device in human speech. The sayings of the prophets and wise men for the same reason often replete with such parables. As can be seen by casting a glance over the Torah and the Gospel. The speech of Prophet Jesus especially is full of them. Similarly, in the Hadith or statements of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, are found many such parables. The Quran has excellent examples of such parables. Real significance of a parable. In a parable, the really important factor is whether or not it successfully portrays the truth it is meant to represent. Its various ingredients in themselves are not important. Whatever means are helpful in depicting a fact and conveying a message to others is employed in a parable to enhance its overall effect. Whether it is a fly, a mosquito, or a spider, or something else. The Quran, for instance, at one place refers to the helplessness of the gods of the polytheists, saying that even if a fly were to snatch something from them, they would not be able to take it back from it, nor do it any harm. It also compares the polytheists' trust and confidence in their gods and, and, and intercessors, trust and confidence in their gods and intercessors to a spider's web. One is as unreliable and flimsy as the other. They, the punctilious Jews who overstressed minor rituals while ignoring the cardinal principles of religion were described by Prophet Jesus as straining out the gnat and swallowing the camel. Matthew, chapter 23, verse 24. Such similes, and parables are, such similes and parables are very useful in making the higher facts or subtle verities of life or the subtle verities of life easily comprehensible to people in general. As such, they have always been highly valued by all true seekers of knowledge and insight who benefit from them. On the other hand, those who are hostile to knowledge and reason and are swayed by their ambitions and caprices are irritated by such parables because they unveil the facts and truths that go against their whims and selfish desires. 
The truth enshrined in a parable is so clear that it is not possible for them to attack it directly. So they focus on some minor parts of it for their venom and scorn. They focus on some minor parts of it to pour their venom and scorn. A case in point is the present verse, which stresses the fact that a most important task in the sight of Allah is to convey his message to his servants. For this purpose, he uses all sorts of examples, even that of a lowly insect like a mosquito. Blinded by hostility, those who are not true seekers of knowledge ignore this message and try to deflect attention from it by frivolous remarks such as, how can this be a book of Allah that finds nothing better than lowly insects like a mosquito or a fly to explain and convey its message? In this flippant way, they deceive themselves as well as others. And he causes none to stray thereby except those who are depraved. The meaning of fisk. The word fisk, the root word from Fasikin, translated as depraved, originally means to leave or to go out of. To leave or to go out of. In the present, in the present context, it is used in the sense of leaving the bounds of goodness for evil and crossing over from obedience to a state of disobedience thereby breaking the command of Allah about Iblis the Quran says quote he was one of the jinns and he broke the command Fasaqa, he broke the command of his sustainer Quran chapter 18 verse 50 Surah Al-Kahf there are various degrees of abandoning good and embracing evil. There are various degrees of abandoning good and embracing evil for there are various degrees of abandoning good and embracing evil or forsaking obedience and taking the path of disobedience and revolt. An evil can be minor in nature or very serious. And similarly, a refusal to obey can be negligible, can be negligible or it can grow into a rebellion. The Quran uses this word, fisk, for all its various categories, from relatively minor evils to the most serious acts of disbelief and revolt. In the main, however, it has been used for those major evils which cannot coexist with faith in any heart. The word fisk should not therefore be taken lightly in the sense of a minor evil, as it is commonly defined by our jurists and scholastic scholars. The importance of kinship. Alladheena yanqudun ahdallahi min ba'di meethaqihi wa yakata'oon ma amara allahu bihi an yusala wa yufsidun fi al-ard ulaika hum al-khasirun those who violate Allah's covenant after having confirmed it and sever what Allah has commanded to be joined and create disorder in the land, it is they who are the losers. Verse 27. And sever what Allah has commanded to be joined. In our view, this refers to cutting asunder blood ties and relationships. After breaking the covenant of Allah, the next evil thing that a wicked person can be guilty of is neglecting his blood relations, treating them with gr gross injustice, treating them with gross injustice or overindulgence. Fear of Allah and maintenance of blood relationships in the sight of Islam form the basis of human culture and social quality. All human welfare and well-being depends on them. Therefore, anyone who violates these two principles invariably creates disorder and corruption on, on earth. Therefore, anyone who violates these two principles invariably creates disorder and corruption on earth. In other words, corruption and disorder in the earth is the inevitable consequence of violating our covenant with Allah and severing the ties of kinship. The Quran describes these two together as one following from another. Thus, for instance, at one place we read, 
فهل عسيتم إن توليتم أن تفسدوا في الأرض وتقطعوا أرحامكم Would you perchance if you turn away from Allah spread corruption in the land and cut asunder your ties of kinship Surah Muhammad chapter 47 verse 22 It is in view of this intimate connection between the divine covenant and the ties of kinship that Qatada takes the words quote, what Allah has commanded to be joined, end quote, to mean the ties of kinship in the above context. Ibn Jarir al-Qabri also prefers this interpretation. Some people take it in a broader sense, saying it refers to cutting asunder or violating whatever Allah has commanded. On the surface of it, this interpretation may not be totally wrong. But when we look at other places where the Quran uses this mode of expression, it invariably refers to ties of kinship. The vagueness of the style enhances and underlines the importance and significance of blood relationships. It is such an obvious fact that it does not have to be named, for everyone understands and recognizes it as something that Allah has commanded to be joined and not to be severed or violated. It lies at the very heart of the well-being and welfare of society, and its violation is tantamount to destroying the entire fabric of social polity. How do you reject Allah? How do you reject Allah seeing that you were lifeless and he gave you life and then he will cause you to die, then restore you to life and then to him you shall be returned. Verse 28. How can you deny Allah? The word kufr, disbelief, has been explained above in verse 6. Here it is used to draw attention to, the, to, draw attention to a particular aspect. The people addressed here did believe in Allah. They did not deny his existence, but they did, however, attribute partners to him. As to the resurrection, they either denied it totally or considered it implausible, far-fetched, and inconceivable. It is this dubious attitude of theirs, resurrection, that is questioned here. How can you deny Allah shows that the Quran uses the term kufr denial in rather a broader sense. It covers denial of Allah as well as denial of resurrection and implies the negation of the essential attributes of Allah, such as oneness, omnipotence, knowledge, and justice. Just as an explicit denial of Allah is kufr, any claim to believe in Allah that is accompanied by a negation of any of his attributes is also a denial or kufr, as indeed it is the case of a denial of resurrection. هو الذي خلق لكم ما في الأرض جميعا ثم استوى إلى السماء فسواهن سبع سماوات وهو بكل شيء عليم He it is who created for you all that is on earth Then he turned to the heaven and fashioned it as seven heavens And of all things he has full knowledge Verse 29. Then he turned to the heaven and fashioned it as seven heavens. Istawa and Taswiya. The word Istawa used in the text means to stand upright. Followed by the preposition Ila, it means paying attention. It means paying attention to or turning to something. This shows that Allah created the heavens after the creation of the earth but in a style that seeks to give us a graphic picture of the process of the creation of the heavens and earth. Standing upright or turning to in the present context must be understood in a sense that is fitting to the majesty and glory of Allah, most exalted one. Similarly, the nominal form taswiyah means making even or smooth and creating balance, moderation and proportion, in the vast heavens above us, whether we look at them with our naked eyes or through 
powerful scientific instruments, we cannot detect any flaw. Alluding to this, the Quran says, الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت فرجع البصر هل ترى من فطور ثم ارجع البصر كرتين ينقلب إليك البصر خاسي أو وهو حسير You will see no fault in the creation of Allah most gracious Then return your vision again and again But your gaze will come back to you dazzled, weary but you will find no fault in it. End quote. Surah Al-Mulk, chapter 67, verses 3 and 4. Sama or Sumu. The word Sama or Sumu means height. The canopy overhead that we call the sky is full of various signs and marvels. The Quran draws our attention to its beauty and wonders. These clearly point out certain manifest facts and invite us to consider these with open minds. As far as the observation of the world or the universe is concerned, as far as the observation of the world or the universe is concerned, as a rule, the Quran does not touch on things that are hidden from most people's eyes or are based on mere guesswork or conjecture, or cannot be seen by the naked eye, or can be observed through instruments, or can be observed through instruments such as microscopes and telescopes only, because there is room for a lot of difference and disagreement concerning them. Instead, the Quran draws our attention to those undeniable facts which no just and honest person can dare deny. This Quranic approach is also apparent from the way it mentions marvels of the heavens. It points out to us certain self-evident facts that need no proof beyond gentle nudge or simple hint to awaken us, to awaken us and to engage our attention. The fact that there are seven heavens is mentioned to emphasize the vastness of Allah's kingdom. This is not limited to the visible sky. This is not limited to the visible sky overhead and the bright stars that shine in it. Allah's kingdom is infinitely vast. Beyond the visible sky and its shining stars lie countless worlds that await being discovered and known. Sequence of meaning in verses 21 to 29. Let us pause here to preview. Let us pause here to review briefly what has been stated above and the order in which it is mentioned before discussing certain other aspects needing further elaboration. To begin with, the descendants of Ishmael are invited in this section to respond to the message of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Quran, the Book of Allah. They are invited to serve and worship Allah and are told that after the advent of the final Prophet, they could worship and serve Allah only by embracing his message. Implied in this is also Implied in this also is the sense that the way they had been worshipping Allah was in fact no worship of Allah because they associated because they associated others in his worship. Allah has no associate or partner and associating others with him in worship simply violates his worship. Simply Allah has no associate or partner, and associating others with him in worship simply vitiates such worship. The section then goes on to describe some attributes of Allah and their manifestations in the universe, showing that showing that there is no showing that there is one and only one God. If they are hesitant in accepting this message because they were not convinced that it was indeed revealed by Allah, or if they thought that it was forged by its presenter or some helper of his, then to settle this issue, let them bring a chapter like it. If they could achieve that, then the, Quran, then the Quran's claim to be a revelation from Allah will automatically stand refuted. To bring a chapter like it 
they could seek help and support from all their helpers and supporters, poets, writers, orators, soothsayers, their gods and goddesses. Then follows a warning of punishment for those who, though unable to bring anything remotely comparable to the Quran, still stubbornly refuse to accept it as a revelation from Allah. This is contrasted with glad tidings for those who respond to the final prophet. This is contrasted with glad tidings for those who respond to the message of the Quran positively and follow the path of faith and righteousness. A remarkable fact mentioned here about the blessings of paradise deserves special attention, deserves special notice. When the people of paradise received their promised reward and gifts, they could be pleased to find them much like the gifts they enjoyed in their worldly life. The fruits of the garden will be remarkably similar to those found in this world. In a way, this is to show that the Book of Allah, which its deniers allege to be merely a forgery, which is which its deniers allege to be merely a forgery and a fable, is a marvelous gift granted to human race. When the veil surrounding our earthly life is finally lifted, they will find that all that the Quran promised them was true. The people of paradise will be overjoyed to find before them the blessings, fruits, and gifts promised them in their worldly life by the Quran. In a way, they would have already known and tasted these blessings previously, thanks to the Quran during their earthly sojourn. In a parenthetical interjection, Away from the main theme, the descendants of Ishmael are cautioned that paradise and its blessings are described here. That paradise and its blessings as described here are merely a parable. Because it is only through parables that anything relating to paradise or hell can be explained to the human being with all the constraints of his physical sentence with all the constraints of his physical senses. Allah is so eager to inform and instruct you. We are told that he uses every kind of parable to make you appreciate the truth, whether drawing on the example of a mosquito or a fly. Those who are sincere seekers of truth understand and appreciate these parables and their knowledge and insight are enhanced. While those who are inclined to error make fun of these parables and are thus trapped in their error. Who are these people who, instead of gaining knowledge and insight from these parables, end up in loss and error? And what are their characteristics? The answer is brief, but quite pregnant with suggestion. The answer also constitutes a forewarning for the descendants of Ishmael that they should not waste their time in frivolous, hair-splitting, about such parables. If they succumb to this disease, they would also be deprived of this great blessing of Allah that he had bestowed on them through his final messenger and the revelation of his book. As this parenthetical comment ends, the above message beginning with the words, O people worship your sustainer, resurfaces in the verse. Resurfaces in the verse how can you deny Allah? Then there follows also, then there follow two arguments concerning resurrection. One deals with the question of how Allah, who created the human being in the first place, can recreate him a second time. The second argument focuses on the overall providential care of Allah, Rububiyyah that upholds and sustains the entire creation. This is discussed at length in the following pages. From this analysis, it is clear that the above section is a coherent piece from the beginning to the end, with each part closely linked to the next. First comes the call to worship Allah. This emphasizes his oneness, because worshiping Allah without accepting his oneness and associating others with him in worship is meaningless.
Then comes an invitation to believe in the Prophet and the miracle of the Quran as an evidence of the Prophet's veracity. The punishment for rejection and the reward for acceptance of truth comes next with a warning against engaging in useless wrangling about words and forms used to convey the message. The warning is also against succumbing to the temptation of mocking the words of truth in the manner of earlier descendants of Israel. Lastly, there follows an invitation to believe in the Day of Judgment. The opening words in which this couched, the opening words in which this is couched, however, make it quite clear that those who claim to believe in Allah but consider the resurrection of the dead an impossibility are in fact not believers in Allah. They are indeed deniers of and disbelievers in His existence. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.